Hi everyone, it's, uh, it's Faith again. We're here for module number 11 for the basic gardening uh, tips with the Fairfield Garden Initiative program. And so we're gonna go through a couple modules today talking about activities that we need to think about right now, early summer, and give you some ideas of what's been happening in some gardens here in Fairfield. I've had the great opportunity to go around and visit some garden, some gardeners and some gardens um, that are enrolled in our program, and I had some wonderful insights on what might be a good topic to talk about for these modules. This module that we're doing right now, module 11, is early summer weeding, watering, and mulching. So here we are again at the Giving Garden at our local um, Extension Fairground. Thank you ISU Extension Office for allowing us to um, participate in the growing here in this garden. All of the produce that we're growing in this garden this season is donated to our local food bank. What a wonderful uh, program to be a part of and also what a wonderful gift to the community. But this is our bed that we planted back on May 22nd. And you can see it's you know starting to, to get some sizable growth on it. Things are ready to harvest. I haven't wanted to harvest anything from this particular garden bed because I wanted you to be able to see um, what that one month of development, one month and a couple of days of uh, growth would do. And then also um, some, some issues that might show up in this bed. Now I haven't grown in this soil before, so all of, this, all of these potential um, soil scenarios are gonna be new to me. I'm just bringing in the knowledge that I have and working with what I um, you know, have in place, the resources that I have that I can gather. And I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I'm noticing with these plants, health issues and pest issues, things like that. But first we're gonna talk about uh, the weeding, mulching and watering. So everything is well watered. We were very fortunate to have gotten about a fourth of an inch of rain uh, yesterday. Our temperatures have been really high over the last several weeks. Right now is um, July 2nd and we are you know, into the beginning of summer. Our heat wave has begun. Um, we've had temperatures in the mid 90s for several weeks through June, the end of June. But we are right now having a nice little cool off. It's about 82 degrees. Um, we'll have that for a couple of um, days yet to come. So wonderful for our plants. They're getting a little bit of a break. We have here a wide diversity of plants. You know, this is an um, eight by six bed. And what we have planted here are three tomato plants, four pole bean plants, three chard, a curly, a thousand head, and a lacinato, a couple of bok choys that have gone to flower, they're about to go to seed, I'm letting that happen. I love to let plants continue in their process if space is not an issue for me. And um, I am a seed collector by nature and so I wanna see what happens. Can I get viable seed from these plants? I don't know, but I'm gonna try. Um, also, I like to let the, the flowers go, or the plants go to flower so that the pollinators will have some, some food sources, something to attract them. We've got chard, two different kinds, a ruby and a, uh, goodness, I always, I always forget this green uh, chard's name. It's Ford something, Ford something, I can't remember. And then we have two cabbages, uh, savoy cabbages, a couple of cel celeries, three peppers that aren't doing so great, our pepper plants. I'll point out some issues with those in a little bit. And we have two spinaches left over. They're doing well considering we've had such a um, heat wave, really. Um, I'm really impressed that they're, they're holding out, but they've been in the shade of these other plants and we've kept everything well watered. That's one thing to consider when you're um, working with cool season crops into the summer, you need to keep them cool. And so what are some ways that you can help keep them cool? One would be watering daily. Um, if your temperatures are up and above uh, 90 degrees, 87, 88, 90 degrees, um, know that these plants would prefer it to be a little cooler. <laughs> and so um, they, they are going to be um, going through a stressful period when those temperatures get so high. And in most cases, 
many of these plants are just initiated to go ahead and go to flower so they can finalize their life cycle, get their seed matured before their structure and body just fades away. So that's what's happening with this bok choy. It couldn't handle it. Um, but the chard and the kale can handle the heat. So can the cabbage, they can handle the heat, but they do need a little support to keep the stress down. And so keeping them watered is um, one way to help keep them cool. Keeping the soil covered um, with a thick mulch is also another way to keep them um, cool, to keep their root systems cool. So if you were to tuck your hand down underneath this mulch, again, it's 82 degrees outside, kind of warm. I'm getting direct sun on me right now. It's, you know, I'll, I'll be looking a little, uh, a little heated in a moment with this direct sun. But underneath this mulch, the temperature is, I'm going to say, at least 10 degrees cooler than what it is in the ambient air temperature. And so that helps keep the um, root system cool, which also um, allows the moisture not to evaporate from the surface of the soil. So they're able to retain their moisture. All microorganisms, those guys that are in the soil right now, um, supporting these plants um, to keep their nutrients uh, topped off. You know, the, the microorganisms are nutrient cycling in the soil. They need moisture in order to survive, all of them. And so it's a really good idea to keep a nice thick mulch layer. And so I'm tucking under this straw right now. And if you were to compress it, it would only be about an inch of straw. But when you let it go, it's about two and a half, three inches. It could be a little bit thicker. And one way that you can tell that your mulch needs to be a little thicker is are, are your weeds are the grass seeds, are the weed seeds able to get enough light to germinate? Um, <clears throat> the mulch that we're using right now is, uh, it's a combination of mulches. Um, we had that uh, mowed mulch, which was a chopped oak leaf straw grass clipping when we first planted the bed. That was the initial, initial mulching. And that was good for an initial mulching, but I needed to come back in and top it off with additional mulch because in a very biologically active bed, you will have microorganisms, you will have earthworms, you will have roly-polies, uh, springtails, all these decomposer organisms who are going to work on that mulch layer that you've laid down and break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller bits of organic matter so that it can be incorporated into the soil matrix. That means it disappears. And that's a beautiful thing. You want your mulch to disappear. You want to have to reapply your mulch a couple of times, three, four, five, six times, if you have a really biologically active um, soil through the summer, through the growing season. And so be prepared with mulch all season long. This straw, as you can see, it's, you know, straw is in essence a grain plant, which is a grass. It's a grain plant that was growing not too long ago. Um, it would have more than likely been harvested last fall when the, when the grain finished up or the mid to late summer, depending on the type of grain, whether it's rye, wheat, barley, oat. So you've got, and if it's a longer stalk like this, you're probably looking at wheat or rye. And so this would have been harvested, um, you know, last end of last summer or the fall, once it's dried down, that, that grain would have been chopped off. They go through with a combine and they take the head of the, the grain off and then they, that standing dead plant that's there is the straw. And so it is kind of like the, you know, we said it's that, what are those called? Pixie sticks or it's a toy, you know, they, it doesn't really um, mat down and it doesn't really create great coverage, but it does create a lofty scenario. And so that, you know, has its benefits. You can get good coverage with it, but you do still get air, or excuse me, light, sunlight, getting down to the surface of the soil where you're gonna have weed seeds that start to germinate. And that's okay, um, beautiful, great. When they're small like this, you can go through and pull them out really easy, not a big deal. But like I said, I like to get a, um, a mulch material that is a little easier to work with. And I just take my bagged mower, like I mentioned last time, and I showed you last time, and I just take my straw and I lay it out on the, on the field and <clears throat> chop it up. So that makes a, um, a, a mat, a layer that sunlight can't get through. 
So if you have an opportunity to do that with a with a, um, a bagged mower, wonderful. If not, just go a little thicker with your straw mulch. And again, tuck your hand under the mulch. Get an idea. What's that temperature? Does that feel comfortable to you? Is it cool? Um, then you know you've got a good layer of mulch. You can, in the early um, season, growing season, when it's still spring and we've got cooler nighttime temperatures and a lot of rain, you can induce um, slugs. You know, you've, you're kind of setting up a great scenario for slugs. You're setting up a good scenario um, for maybe some fungal diseases to uh, incubate right near your plants so you could encourage dampening off and and different you know soil based fungal organisms that are going to try to attack your plant but <clears throat> so going a little lighter in the early part of the growing season is fine but once we get into these high temperatures early summer you really need to get that mulch deep thick so go at least three inches kind of take a look can you see the soil at all through your mulch. If you can, you need to go a little deeper. I just did a little experiment here. I love to know the details. And so we have at about six inches down in the soil, it is 75 degrees in, you know, in this bed. And then if you use a, um, a digit, you know, basic digital thermometer, you can pull this, <clears throat> you can pull the mulch back and just get a, reading on your soil right there. That one's right on the edge. Let me get a little closer in here. 79 degrees. So it's about four degrees cooler. If I put my hand in there, it feels much cooler, but it's really only about four degrees cooler right at the surface. And, um, you know, 75 degrees, about six inches down, but it's nice and moist. And again, we had about a quarter inch of rain yesterday and then we water here at least every other day. So when you're watering in the early summer, think about evaporative um, issues, you know, and so the mulch is going to help with that, but don't water in peak sun if you can help it. That's you, potentially you are um, kind of wasting a little bit of your water. You will have a scenario, especially if it's a little windy and it's peak sun, it's really hot, uh, that water that you've just applied will evaporate. And you may, you know, stress the plant just a little bit. I've actually never seen um, the scalding of a plant by watering in peak sun. I haven't seen it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Um, water off, off um, hours of peak sun. And so before, um, you know, say at this time of year, before 10 a.m. or um, after 5 p.m., 6 p.m., Peak sun is really like 11 to 3, but go a little further outside of that before 10 and after 5. Uh, I think you'll get more mileage out of your water. So the weeding, again, it's a good idea to come through and take a look at what weeds are showing up and um, how pervasive are they. Um, these are grass weeds prim primarily. We're not seeing much else here. <coughs> in the way of weeds. We'll, we'll see some other weeds and actually you more than likely can see um, back behind us. We'll talk a little bit about these weeds in the back here uh, in a moment, but um, if you let the weeds get larger than, you know, six inches or so, you may have trouble getting them out of your bed. Uh, their root systems will be pretty well established. If they are a weed that has not started to produce a seed head and um, are not a, a type of weed that will replicate from a root fragment, then um, it's okay to use it in your mulch. It's fine. Um, if it is a weed, you know, provided that it's not a, you know, poisonous weed, <laughs> um, but, you know, like a poison parsnip or a poison ivy, something like that, of course, you wouldn't want that broken up into your mulch. But if it's just like plantain and um, dandelion and grass and velvet leaf and, and weeds like that, it's fine to leave them um, in your, in your uh, mulch area, especially right on top. A grass can be pretty uh, resilient. And so if that little bitty root system is able to touch the soil, it may start to root again. 
but it just won't have the same um, veracity to do that. So I have got a little list of a couple of weeds that are pretty common in our area and several of them are in this bed back here. I haven't weeded that bed right there. One with intention to just, you know, what is the progression of these weeds? What weeds are they? Um, how long does it take for them to go to seed? We have a few of the um, sow thistle and the uh, flea bane that are starting to go to seed and so it's time to take those weeds down and utilize that bed. I'm going to plant root crops in that bed. But um, I don't like to clear a bed until I'm ready to plant it because one, uh, you know, the weeds may just come back and I'm going to have to do it again. Uh, two, they're photosynthesizing and they're feeding a selective suite of organisms right now. They're going to be the kind that associate with those weeds. But nonetheless, that bed is being um, uh, nurtured in a way. And so it's not so much of an issue to leave those weeds in the ground for me right now. It's time to take them out because they are starting to go to seed. I'll do that. Um, but it's still, uh, you know, any of them that aren't going to seed, I will go ahead and utilize them in the chop and drop mulch. I'll run the bagged mower over them and uh, use them in the mulch. And so, like the flea bane, which is, um, it, it creates this little tiny daisy flower, a cluster of little tiny daisy uh, type white flowers. You know, it's an indicator that we've got um, non-soluble bases. And so um, it has potentially calcium, magnesium, potassium that are in excess there. Um, it also is an indication that there are some of those, you know, those more alkaline uh, elements are soluble. It's an indicator that there's a deficiency in air, so it's an indicator that that um, soil is a little more compacted. One of the primary weeds over there is the prickly lettuce or the wild lettuce. And that is, you know, its indication is, ooh, yep, it, that it has the basis, you know, extra calcium, magnesium, or potassium, indication of a little bit of a compaction issue. Um, also, and it's, a, it's an indication of overall, you know, some, some organic matter that's elevated, and that's not a bad thing. It just needs to be cycled down but kind of hard to do if the soil is compacted and slightly anaerobic. Um, it also is an indicator that that organic matter has um, high nitrogen and it is also an indicator that there is um, that it's you know um, kind of weathered soil and so each one of those plants over there has its own suite of conditions that would indicate that that plant is you know that seed could break dormancy and um, start to grow there. And then each one of those plants has its role in that ecosystem. It is there to remedy those problems. And so I like to leave the weeds until it's time. I don't let them go to seed or I try not to. Of course, nobody's perfect. We're all letting some things go to seed. We're all accidentally letting some soil go bare and get really dry and, um, and uh, become not great oxidized. But let's just all take a little bit of, um, you know, grace in that moment and say, okay, you know, I'm learning a lesson and, um, and be experimental. Let yourself be a little bit on the um, inquisitive side. If you have the space and the time to allow that, um, you could make some observations. What are your weeds telling you? And what roles are they performing in your garden that you don't necessarily want to perform at this moment. They're keeping it covered. They're keeping the microbes fed. They're bringing some of those, um, those non-soluble bases up into their plant matter, making them available to the topsoil. That's awesome. So using those weeds in the chopped up mulch, when you do your carbon and green material mulch, seems like a good idea. That's the, that's the um, perfect scenario to put those um, weeds back into action. They were meant to do that. They are creating a, a biomass that helps remedy that soil. So add it back in as a little homeopathic remedy for that um, particular bed. So that was module number three. We we're talking about watering, mulching, and weeding. So in early summer, we just need to be very mindful that we're being conservative with our water by keeping our soil well mulched, 
we're watering outside of the peak sun hours and we're not letting our weeds get ahead of us and the mulch can help with that. All right, thank you.